Hello and welcome to the Work for Change podcast. My name is John, spelled like Jean. And my name is John with a silent H. Welcome to episode number 3030. Yeah. Of this the Work for Change podcast. Fun episode. Yeah, this is, I, I would tell, say. Tell us how it happened. This one, well, I mean, I, I just asked my friend Zach to come on the podcast. That's this how it happened. Thrilling. <laughs> it's a very good story. <laughs> um, but so Zach, yeah, he was the. The person that we're interviewing, his name's Zach. His last name, I don't know how to pronounce. So I'm not going to try. Uh, he runs the Instagram business uh, called Flexible Dieting Lifestyle. Revolution, Zach, you could call it? I, I would not call it the, that. The Flexible Dieting <laughs> revolution <laughs> it's actually flexible dieting lifestyle john okay um but he he is a great source of information for people that are trying to you know find a way to eat foods that they love while still hitting their goals and i mean that's a very simplified version of what he does he has a ton of knowledge when it comes to nutrition and this this podcast is by far the most we've been able to dive into nutrition and stuff which is something that i'm actually pretty passionate about but i know that that could get really boring if that's something that we're doing all all the time so it was nice to have a guest on that we could kind of talk to about those things and it helps that he's like a dynamic sp- personality it, yeah you know he, what I mean? so it's like he's we, a good storyteller we get, we get into the into the weeds a little bit of nutrition but like it's never too like you don't feel like you're in a classroom yeah you're not listening to a professor talk yeah. to you about uh you know <laughs> proteins and carbs and all this stuff and it, it was it was it was just a really fun conversation and again like i said he's a good storyteller so i think it's there's a lot of good little nuggets that are going to be coming out of this episode and i i'm really excited for people to hear because one of my biggest things when it comes to nutrition is we see it as this huge dragon that needs to be slay i kind of said this later in the podcast it's this huge dragon that we need to slay but when you start to listen to people that understand it and are able to break it down in really simple things it's a really simple concept it's different you know trying to apply the concept that's where the difficulty comes in you know simple doesn't mean easy and so but it is a simple concept and hopefully this podcast will be able to show you how simple it is and give you tools to apply that to your everyday life yeah and i think that this episode is really going to help enrich your fitness your whatever like life like it really does give you tools in an easy-to-handle way to make simple changes to increase and improve your life, your fitness, your whatever, help you reach your goals. Um, and a lot of what he talks about is cross-pollination. Like You can apply those principles to so many other things, which is so true for so many things. Mm-hmm. So it's really exciting to know that we are giving you guys a podcast that is going to add a lot to your knowledge base, and it's really cool that we got to be a part of that. Yep. And we want to say thank you to Zach for being a part of it. But we're not done yet. We're going in. This is just beginning. Yeah. So there was one thing that yeah. I want to bring up. Yeah. Bring if up. if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll uh-huh. see the shirt that I'm wearing. The new shirts are coming out very soon. We don't have a date yet, but we obviously have it, them now. Yeah. It's, so it's safe gonna, to say we think it'll be with about it, a week. At, yeah, at least. So, so maybe if you're listening to this... Or if you're watching, you can see it. But if you're listening, go to any of our Instagrams. We've posted a couple pictures with the shirt on. Yeah. We really like it. So, um, yeah, it's they're how coming out soon. How does it fit? It fits very well. It's super soft, right? It's very soft. It's like a. It's almost like a tie-dye. I don't even know how to it's explain it. It's like a tie-dye it. acid wash. Yeah, with uh, blue, white, and then like this like pinkish, reddish. Yeah, we're, we are selling it we're hard We're killing right it right now. But um, then it says work for change. It's very it's very nice. And also, uh, the original work for change shirts will be releasing again as well. With extra. So, um, we won't run out as fast, but we still very well. Probably very, will very, run out. Yeah, we probably will run out. So, you should still get there as soon as you can. Um, but we did try to up the load this time. Yeah. Um, so, we guys, we hope you enjoy this episode, episode 30 of the Work for Change podcast with Zach from the Flexible Dieting Lifestyle. Well, when you got quads as big as both of you. I know. All three of us. I know. know. Our quads are too big for this table. (laughs) I know. (laughs) You got to (laughs) upgrade. We need a bigger table for it to fit our quads in it. So I went to Ikea, Ikea, that's where I got this table, and they had a much bigger one. And I was like, I'm going to get that. I want it. And they were sold out. So then instead of, you know, being patient and waiting for them to we're get a new table, being I was like, I'll just get the size down. And as soon as I brought it into this office, I was like, I should have got the bigger table. Was it? I how much more was it? it? Well, it was like 20 bucks more or something. Like Kia is really cheap. So it was like, wasn't that much more cost wise, yeah. but it was like literally double 
the, oh, the size. Yeah. yeah. should have done that. I, when I walked in and I saw this table, I was like, man, this is going to be a tight fit. Yep. Hey, you know we're, what? We're but I'm cool. I'm cool with it. We're I'm too cool wide. We just wanted to be really we, close. To yeah, you. you know, we figure that if you're close in proximity, you're gonna have heart to heart. The closer our hearts are together, you know, we are. Yeah. So. That's yeah. What exactly. All right. So Zach, you are the flexible dining lifestyle on Instagram, YouTube, any social media, right? Mm-hmm. How How did that happen? It's super interesting. I have a uh, especially if you have a big CrossFit audience, which I know you do. It came from my first spot in strength and conditioning was interning at a CrossFit gym. And at the time, what was the most popular diet in the CrossFit world and space? That was in 2011. And it was the paleo diet. And it was all over the place. It was like the, the today's keto diet. Mm -hmm. And yeah. for me, it was my first, no pun intended, taste of the nutritional world. It was the first moment in my life where I was like, okay, I'm going to take to take control of my nutrition. And so I tried paleo. I did it for about a year and a half and it was, it was, it was great. It taught me to enjoy vegetables, eat more lean protein, stop eating as much quote unquote junk and to really prioritize high quality foods. But what it also did is it gave me a weird scoring system of nutrition. It taught me there were good and bad foods. And there was no dose sensitive, uh, dose, uh, there was no dose associated with it. It was either good or bad. You were breaking the rules. You were cheating or you weren't. And that really messed me up because I would go seven to 10 days and I'd be good. Um, and then all of a sudden on the seventh to 10th day, I would have this massive cheat day. Yeah. That's like w is similar to the story that I tell when uh, I'm talking about my binging. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I struggled with binging for, I would say, a couple years. I, it's hard for me to really pin it down because I don't know when the first binge was, you know. But for a while during my weight loss journey, I had the same exact relationship with food. And I think it's pretty normal for a lot of people. You know, when you start any sort of diet, if you're coming from nothing – and then you, so nothing is you're eating anything you want. You don't really care, right? So you're starting from that. You, It's so easy to just jump in head first and be like good and bad. That's like how you think of food. And so like that's what I did when I was losing most of my weight. But for me, it was like instead of seven days, I would go like three days because on top of – eating clean, you know, in quotes, I was eating very little amount of food too, right? So it would last three, four days. I'd have a bad food again in quotes. And then it was, oh, I already messed up. So I'm going to eat everything. Yeah. That, that's a, that's a funny thing. It's a, a correlation, not causation, but more times than not when you're eating clean or you're eating paleo, that's why it works is because you're replacing a lot of the highly palatable calorically dense foods with a lot of more high volume foods like vegetables and lean protein sources. And then as a byproduct, you eat a lot less calories, but what happens is you get this physiological response where you were used to getting 3,500 calories, 4,000 calories, and then you're all the way down to like 1,500 and your body's just like, what's going on here? Like I need more calories. So not only are you depriving yourself of the foods that you, that, that taste really good that you used to have all the time, you're also creating this physiological response of like, my body wants more food. There's no gradual process. There's not like going from, um, I used to eat a whole box of Oreos. To like I eat a couple. Mm -hmm. It's like all it's or nothing. It's really hard to get to that point. Oh, and absolutely. I think it's possible. It's possible hundred percent. And I think that that should be the end goal for most people. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's definitely possible. Sorry, I interrupted you. So you started doing the paleo stuff and then. Yeah. And so, uh, about a year and a half in, I needed to go back to the drawing board because I remember this exact moment. I, I, I would make this list. I would be like, all right, this is the, these are the foods I'm going to have on my cheat day. Like it was the coolest list ever. I was just like, <laughs> all right, bang, bang, so bang, bang. So you would do cheat days? Absolutely. Okay. Well, it was, it was so common in the paleo oh, world. Yeah. It was just common in dieting in general, I think at that point. Yeah, it was wild. And so I, I would make that list and share it with my friends and we were all just talking about it. It was just a normal thing. And then one time I left the grocery store and I forgot one thing and it felt like my whole world was falling mm -hmm. apart. And I was like... Because you're living for that food at that yeah. point. Yeah. I was like, man, what is this? I'm like, this is absolutely absurd. Do you remember what that food item was? Uh, yeah, it was these Oreo, like, churros. Of course it was Oreos. Oh, yeah. my Yeah, gosh. it was these Oreo <laughs> frozen churro things. I understand that you're, my world would have fallen apart, too. Oh, man. <laughs> I was like, oh, man, how did I forget that? So that was the moment where I was like, okay, there's there's something going on well, here. Cause th yeah, you realize that, because there's that saying, right, living for the weekend. Mm-hmm. For a lot of people that are dieting, it's living for the cheat meal. Yep. And it's 
it's hard to tell somebody you can never cheat, which I don't think is what should be happening anyways. Yep. But you do need to be very consistent. So I think that from what I've realized is having being cons- uh, having an 80% consistency is a lot better. Like 80% consistency always is better than 100% consistency 60% of the time. Mm-hmm. I know that's very <laughs> – but like, you know, if you're at 100% consistent, but you're only being 100% consistent half of the week, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But if you're 80% consistent all of the week, that's – it's, it's a lot of numbers. I feel like the guy from... Uh, yeah, so 60% of the time. Yeah, it works, works every, every time. time. <laughs> yeah, is this the law? That's all life is. It's the law of averages. Are you showing up most of the time? And it's it's kind of like, for example, let's say uh, you're somebody who just completely disregards, like just goes so hard, but then just has this massive cheat day of like 7,000 calories. And then you, let's say you were eating 1,500 your weekly average, you just added an extra thousand calories to your weekly average and then thus you've just thrown everything out of proportion. Mm-hmm. And, and and it's like, man, maybe if we just had you ate more each day, your weekly average would be different. So that's when I needed to go back to the drawing board and understand why does paleo actually work? I read a book called Star, uh, by I read a book called Start with Why by Simon Sinek. And that got me to, that was in a moment in my life where I read a book a week for four years. And <laughs> that, Dude, that was intense. Four years? Yeah, it was intense. It was that's a commitment. Crazy. Yeah, that's... It takes me about a month to read a book. <laughs> it was it was one of those things where I, I hate sitting down and reading, but it was just one of those things I needed to do for myself because uh, prior to, to that whole process of self-development, I was very mediocre in a lot of aspects of my life. I, w- I had been handed a lot of things. Um, I Believe it or not, I'm five foot eight. I... I had a full ride to play college basketball. I uh, played for a year and a half, played Division Two, And uh, I'm white, by the way, guys, for anybody that's listening. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was a s- very skilled player. I understood the game very well. and But up until that point, I was the kid that would party all the time, mm-hmm. uh, was not taking care of any aspects of his performance. He wasn't sleeping enough. He wasn't eating enough. So your background as far as sports, sportsing and stuff was basketball it was it was pretty much every sport i grew up in the water surfing from the okay. moment i came onto this earth and i was pretty much a surfer and uh, a basketball player but I, I played all i was always good at any sport i was always very athletic and I, I just naturally excelled at various things like that and along the way playing many different sports being a surfer and then a basketball player your personality uh, tends to to be very versatile um but then also throughout that process i just neglected all these different things. So during my sophomore year, anybody who's listening that understands anatomy, I tore my iliopsoas tendon, which is like this think of ripping a filet mignon steak. So I tore that. And whenever it did tear, it felt like a gunshot. Is that like by your hip? Yep. Okay. And so it, it literally is, is this, this, how did you do that? Uh, it was insidious. It just happened over time. Oh, okay. uh, there's no way there's that that can just rip just in a healthy state. It's tugging on it. So slowly. it was like an overuse kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. And 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 weak around it. That tendon that tendon was having to do so much work. Not stretching. Not yeah. Uh, yeah. There was zero. Super there was. Tight, n- yeah. I would I would be. We'd have basketball practice at four forty five in the morning. Ooh. I would be out till about four fifteen drinking. Come back, put my shoes on, and go to practice. That's, that's insane. Sounds like a good life. Yeah. That's, yeah. Like, that's, that's a lot like my life, actually. Oh, so, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally, Jean. <Yeah>. Definitely <laughs> huge drinker and partier. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, it was, I got away with it for a while. Uh, my when best. You're, when you're my, young like that, man. Oh. And we're not even that old, but still. Oh. <laughs> it's just different. When you're like in college. I, you're naive. You're, you, you don't know what feeling good feels like. Mm-hmm. Because you, you just, yeah, you, you lose sight of that. And so, like, my, my best friend now who trains NBA guys, he was my roommate at the time when we were both competing for a starting job as freshmen and uh, starting point guard. And he was going to bed early. And he would see me walk in the room and grab my shoes and knew that I would, but he never told anybody. Mm. And eventually caught up with me after my first semester. This is something, I, I don't tell this story often. I've I need, never heard this before. Yeah. I this need, is interesting to I me. need to talk about this more, but after my first semester, I had a 1.25 GPA and Ooh. I was ruled ineligible. I couldn't oh. play my second semester. I what rem- was that like? Oh, it was, it was the one moment where I was like, Zach, you got caught. I was like, you got caught. We're in I high school. I get goosebumps whenever I talk <laughs> about it. Yeah. In high school, were you, did you have pretty good grades? I mean, I had a, a 3.5, mm-hmm. uh, but high school was a, not I'm not a joke, but it was just like 
you could get by. I was always witty. I could always. And you're, you're I mean, you're a smart guy. Yeah. So you were able to kind of maybe, like you were saying, you were able to get by on minimum. You yeah. were just putting minimum effort to get by, mm-hmm. I'm assuming. I, I understood know. the game of public school. I uh-huh. understood yeah. it. I yeah. understood it very well. And when I go to college and all the teachers are, uh, the school I went to is pretty much called Notre Dame South. And it's all PhDs. You have to have a PhD to teach there. And so I'm getting all these like retired big time people from like Princeton, Yale, Notre Dame as my professors when I had never written more than a five paragraph essay in my life. And I get, and I have all this freedom. I have all these obligations I have in school. And my first four weeks, I'm given five, five page papers on like philosophy and literature and all these things that are just like, what? Like, and I remember, yeah, I remember being home for Christmas break and the day before I'm going back to school, and we're going to, I'm supposed to be going to a Christmas tournament. I know I'm not going because of my grades. And I had to tell my mom what my grades were and they had to cancel their trip to go see me play. Jeez. Cause, and you, you, your mom and your dad are pretty close. Oh, we're very close. Were you close then too? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And the look on my mom's oh. face, it, I, I'll never forget it. I was like, Zach, I was like, when you make a decision like that, you're hurting more than just yourself. Yeah. And I was like, man, that was, that was a big moment. And then obviously when I had my, my injury, because I was in a wheelchair for close to a month, didn't run for over a year. Uh, that that was a huge moment because I was no longer Zach the basketball player. It was cool being a short white kid and the only white kid on most basketball teams that I was on. You're an outlier. And I, I would walk in and everybody's like, huh? It's fun subverting expectations like that. Oh, absolutely. It's like the most fun thing. I used to I used to feel the same way when I would play drums with my band because I was very big. Yeah. And so people would assume that I'm going to be very like chill on the drums, but yeah. I would go nuts. Hey, mm-hmm. And people would be like, I had no idea that you were going to drum like that. So yeah. yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, it's 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 cool it was it was one of those things it was just so cool i i always had a diverse amount of friends that i would but getting getting to that point when i was 20 i had that injury and so i had somebody say something to me it was super profound it was zach what are people going to say about you when you die at your funeral and i never really thought about that and i didn't like the answer there was no impact associated with it and so i wanted to 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 reverse that and so that's when i started stop partying I started being selfish and I understood that the more value that I could bring to myself, the more I could give. I didn't really have much to give besides just being funny or being nice and listening, but that was it. And so I decided to, to, instead of on my Friday and Saturday nights going out, I was reading. So, uh, I, I read a book a week for four years that changed my life. I don't really read anymore now because all the books rhyme. They all say the same things. (laughs) And I, I love to apply what I know now. I learn more from through application. And so along that way, uh, I learned so much about nutrition and training, anatomy, physiology. That was pretty much what stemmed it. And then by the time I graduated from school, I had already started my first training business. I was uh, uh, one of the head assistants for the basketball program. That's what I kept my scholarship. But then I also transitioned into the strength and conditioning coach for three teams at the university. So I had a lot of things going on that led to that moment. And so I graduated from school and went and started my own training business out of the backyard of my parents' house. I have a degree in economics. And my parents, whenever I said I was turning down, the typical progression was you go to Wall Street after you graduate from my school with a degree in economics, and then you apprentice under uh, a veteran on Wall Street. And then in three to five years, you're at that level, and then you're uh, having another apprentice. And that looked like 80000 right off the bat. Like right off the bat and all my friends were doing really well and I decided to start my training, graduate out of my way driving home, which is about a six hour drive from where I went to school. I'm picking up equipment that I had bought off Craigslist Mm -hmm. to bring to my parents' backyard and start training at the backyard. My mom was like, are you you kidding me? Like what? Mm -hmm. Like you're not even going to use your college education? I was like, no, I I mean, I used it. (laughs) I used it. it. It taught me a lot. Gave me a lot of responsibility. I know I know how to learn now. I know how to learn very well, uh, and then yeah. So that I mean, I ended up graduating college with three point seven GPA. Oh wow! So I flipped that on its head. Um, but yeah, it's my life's been one of extremes. So it was. I mean, man, this is just it's just such a long winding story. There's just been a lot that's happened, but it's it's a cool it's a cool progression. So I start training people out of backyard in my parents' house. Eventually, it leads to me working out a deal with the city facility. Uh, I'm paying them a percentage of my income, so I have no overhead 
I end up building up three months in a row of about 30K in revenue uh, each month in personal training. Then I eventually build my own gym, 5,000 square foot facility. Uh, and I'm, 20, I'm 24 years old, my own gym in a very nice area. Uh, I'm known as like the go-getter entrepreneur. And I eventually sell that gym about two years ago because I, I didn't love it. And my mom was freaking out again. She's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> what kind of um, training like was that gym? Did uh, you, were you doing personal training? I were was. You? Yeah, it was personal training and uh, athletic performance. Uh, but the big thing I noticed and why I love nutrition so much was it wasn't necessarily the training that I was doing in the gym that was helping people the most. It was the lifestyle and nutrition. It was them telling me about their day and us being able to make audibles and me teaching them on how to, at any moment, make the right decision with their nutrition. The one that is the be- not the most perfect decision, but the best one that they can at the time. Mm-hmm. And just putting them in a position to succeed. And so that was just so cool, being able to see the power of that. Me training somebody two to three times per week but knowing the training was just... It's it was, just like a chance to talk to them and yeah, give them information. Yeah. yeah. and But it, it, it helped. Uh, it was more movement-based, helping them move really well. And so then they can move throughout life, creating a, a small, pretty powerful physio- physiological response from training. But it was more just like sprinkling in nutrition throughout that process and then helping them truly understand how in c- control they are. Yeah, it's... It, it, it's it's it was super cool i learned a lot but it, that's when i really understood man this world i mean nutrition is simple in theory but in application it's very difficult so what i find super frustrating um is that you can't out train a bad diet mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true <laughs> and like john i have tried that's the bane of john's existence yeah. is like being able to john wants to be able to eat a whole pizza twice a week and still have, like, be shredded. No, I wouldn't <laughs> say a whole pizza twice a week, but definitely at least once a week. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then it's, like, the more the more I realize, like, the ma- like training is training. So if you're really into, like, cycling or you're really into um, whatever, CrossFit or bodybuilding or whatever, like, training is training. What is going to make the difference in, like, what's going to make the difference is your nutrition, what you're eating, right? Like, is that kind of where you saw as a personal trainer, stuff like that? You were just kind of like, you can come here, you can do all the stuff, but if you're not going to change your diet or you're not going to change your lifestyle, um, you're going to find yourself in the same spot. Or yeah. You're going to be, you're going to be frustrated. I mean, if the first thing you say Amen. to me is something about <laughs> you want to look better, it's like, okay, what's the number one way we're going to be able to do this is like, I need buy-in with your nutrition. Mm-hmm. Like what you're like, the amount of calories we think we burn <laughs> through exercise is absolutely absurd. Yeah. Uh, there's been multiple studies doing this where they'll have somebody go on a treadmill and they'll ask them, how many calories do you think you burn? And on average, people were saying like 800 to 900. How long How long were they on the treadmill? I don't know no. the exact details, but um, and they wanted them to burn. There was a group. There was two groups. So the one group burned 200 calories. Another group, they, I mean, they tested it uh, 300 calories. And so on average, the 200 calorie group thought they burned 800 calories. <laughs> the yeah. 300 calorie group thought they burned 900 calories. And so what they do is they're like, okay, I'm going to eat back 550. Yeah. And it's like, oh, well, that's not really what happened. And when I truly understood that I wake up in the morning, no matter what, I could lay in bed, do absolutely nothing, literally absolutely nothing, just breathe, not even blink my eyes, and I'll burn 60% of the calories I was going to burn anyways. Yeah. It's like, whoa. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, whoa. And then when I ingest food... I'm burning calories associated with the digestion process of that. So let's put that because that's going to be 10% of calories. Mm -hmm. Let's put that at 70%. And then you're left with, okay, lifestyle calories. Like I'm going to burn calories just walking around. I'm going to burn calories on this podcast, fidgeting my hands Mm -hmm. and having animated motions. Like there's, that's what we call neat non-exercise activity thermogenesis It's it's this fidgeting. It's the movements of, of just life in general. And then you add the workout on the very end. Yeah. And it's like, Wow, like when you truly understand it, it's like, it's just an equation. I remember for the longest time, I was the person that literally, I thought the only time you burn calories is when you're working out. Mm-hmm. So I would be, I would go to the gym. Like when I first started working out, I would go to the gym and I'd, I'd do like a little circuit of, you know, treadmill, elliptical, you know, uh, bike or whatever. And I would burn 
and and with all three of those, I would you know, just look at the calories on the thing. It maybe be a thousand. And so in my head, I'm like, I can I can't even eat a thousand calories today. Like I didn't I I just didn't understand mm-hmm. all of that stuff, you know. And so like that's why so many people like the only I feel like the only time like the amount of calories you're burning is really that big of a deal as f- during exercises if you're doing like crazy endurance stuff where you're working out literally for like three hours like mm-hmm. like the long runs that i'm doing that are burning like you know 1500 to 2000 calories yep. then it's like a little bit different but for most people the amount of calories you're burning working out yep. it if just doesn't matter if you're going in the gym you're lifting a couple of things you're maybe there for an hour ish yeah you know you're not you're not at the 500 yeah. calorie range well, you, you think of like active like literally active working out so for example when we go to a g- the gym the amount of time we're actually working out like literally in motion with the weight is so minimal most of our time at the gym is actually resting between sets so when we think about that it's like you're training for the physiological benefits yeah so one thing with training is uh, first and foremost the more muscle you have the more places you have to store food Mm -hmm. that's number one to store calories you don't have any muscle all the extra calories are going right to body fat you just become really good at storing body fat Mm -hmm. it's a survival mechanism but also with the physiological response associated with your nutrient partitioning is so much higher so if you have more muscle you have more energy demands what your body's going to see is i'm going to shuttle more of this to our muscle and a lot as much to our, our fat because we have this demand on our body. And you'll notice like if you don't tra- train for like five, six days, you might weigh the same, but you look flat. You look, it's just because you haven't given your body that, that shuttling process. It's just mm-hmm. a signal to your body to, I mean, that's the same thing with like insulin sensitivity. It's like, man, what's one way to improve your insulin sensitivity? Build some muscle. Start training. Yeah. Like literally give your body that survival mechanism and, and then it's going to get better over time. It's not it's not really a sugar thing. It's not really it's more of a, a calorie equation. It's like you don't see a lot of people that are dealing with insulin issues. I mean, there's a lot of them some hereditary, some type two type stuff, but type one is more of you just ate you got too much body fat on you. Mm-hmm. That's really it. Flip that. Yeah, flip type, t- no, no, type one is genetic. Type my my fault. Yeah, yeah, my, yeah. that's my, my his, fault. His fiance has. No, type no, no, one. that's my fault. That's, <laughs> my fault. <laughs> that's why he knows. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but one of my favorite um, like sayings for people who are trying to lose weight, um, and they muscles are expensive. Like they're expensive for your body to keep. So if you're not fueling them, if you're not giving them enough calories, if you're not like allowing them to maintain your body's gonna be like let's get rid of the muscles like if you're not eating enough if you're not your body's literally gonna be like let's get rid of those those are expensive they take a lot more calories if we're in survival mode we're gonna get rid of all the muscle we can so that we can maintain the calories because Mm -hmm. they're gonna be eating more um and so a lot of people i think they have that fear of adding calories when when they're coming off weight loss they have the fear of adding calories because in their mind calories were the thing that got them fat Mm -hmm. and so if they're if they're working out and they're adding calories they think i'm gonna get fat again but they don't realize like no your muscles want those calories like Mm -hmm. they want to eat those they want to feed off that and if you're not giving your body that then it it won't build the muscle because it's it's not efficient (laughs) you know like well our body just wants to trust us 100 percent. it's trust it's just as if you're in a, a marriage and you like for example most of the time are a good human being with your spouse. Like she's going to trust you. If you don't lie most of the time, she's going to trust you. Mm-hmm. But if you're constantly giving signals of eating less calories, more calories, it's like, well, what do you believe? So your body just loves consistency. It's like, okay, can I trust you or not? That's literally it. So with building muscle, it's, it's giving your body that stimulus of enough calories to where it's like, okay, we can afford. It's kind of like, if you're making twenty thousand dollars a year, don't be going to Starbucks every day and buying a, a coffee. Like you just can't afford it. Mm-hmm. But if you're making a hundred thousand, you can go to Starbucks and get that coffee. And it, you know, not much is going to change in your life. You're not going to be in a point where you're going to run out of money. It's the same thing with building muscle. If, if, if you're eating really little amounts of calories, your body's not going to be like oh, we can afford to build this beautiful pound of muscle Mm -hmm. uh, with such little money. It's an expensive luxury to have, but it's a great investment. So that's where it's like 
you you add a little bit more calories, but most people they go from zero to one hundred. Yeah. They'll 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 say uh, they'll eat really low, and then they'll just shuttle themselves calories like crazy, and then there's not that fine line. Yeah. It's like well, you're first off if you're if your body's not trusting you to to build muscle. It's not going to trust you even more just for by giving it a couple days of more calories. It's going to be like, whoa, like what the heck is going on? What's the easiest way to store calories? Body fat. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a slow, gradual process. That's when people talk about like reverse dieting and things yeah. like that. Like it, I, I think it's more correlation than causation. It's just building trust and getting your body to use that nutrient partitioning. For me, I, I recently made a post on my Instagram where I said uh, that – one. Personally, for me, I think two of the most important words when it comes to like sustained weight loss, gaining muscle, all that stuff, fitness, in, in just any fitness in general, is patience and consistency. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to like losing massive amounts of weight, in the long term, losing weight happens pretty quick. Mm -hmm. No matter how you're doing it, even if you're doing it pretty slowly, by terms of instead of doing some sort of crash diet where you're you know losing 50 pounds in a month, even if it takes you three years to lose 100 pounds. That's only three years because if you think about it, you're going to be – if ideally, you're keeping that weight off forever now, right? So weight loss is something that when you first start doing it, mainly massive weight loss, it's very easy to see progress. So it's, it's a lot easier. It's still hard, but it's a lot easier to be uh, – to see like the progress and, and feel motivated, right? Because you see the progress week to week. You can see changes. You can feel changes. You can see the changes in the mirror. Clothes are fitting differently. All that stuff. So that's it. Becomes very normal to see changes relatively quickly. Again, everyone's different, right? But then once you end up getting to your goal weight, I don't really like that word, but getting to a point where it's like I I don't need to lose weight anymore. Mm -hmm. I need to do some. There has to be another plan. It can't be I. Personally, I think that just trying to lose weight and then be like, I'm only maintaining this forever. I don't think that's going to work for most mm -hmm. people. I think there should be some sort of plan. It doesn't have to be I want to build a bunch of muscle, become a bodybuilder. It could be I want to run marathons. It could be I want to do something. At, like there's something other – there's some other goal I have now that's going to help in maintaining my weight, not gaining too much, you mm -hmm. know. Um, it, and it could be anything. It could be I want to get – freaking massive right like that was my goal when i first started um and but that all of these other aspects the the patience meter has to be a lot bigger because when it comes to building muscle we all know that is naturally that is a year years and years and years it takes like when i look at when i make transformation pictures of my muscle gain it is like five years between right mm -hmm. and it's not you can you can notice a difference, but it's not crazy. When you look at my weight loss transformation, one year it took me to lose most of my weight, mm -hmm. and you know I didn't do it the best ways. I've talked about that before, but it's not like I just did a complete crash diet where I wasn't eating anything. It was it's pretty normal to lose a hundred pounds in a year. You know I lost a little bit more than that, but that that's not a hundred pounds in a year isn't that crazy. There's no no way you're gaining close to 100 pounds of muscle ever <laughs> right like ever so maybe five to ten pounds if you're just starting out in a year of muscle mm -hmm. so it's like the 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 patience becomes so much more important once you get down to that weight and it becomes more important even as you're losing weight because the more weight you have to lose the faster it comes off at the start mm -hmm. but once you get closer to that goal weight it's like the uh it, yeah once you get closer to that goal weight it slows down. It's just normal. Like consistency and patience is so important. We want to give a huge shout out to Viore for partnering with us on this podcast, on this episode. Viore, spelled V-U-O-R-I, is a comfort slash fitness clothing brand that makes the most comfortable and the most fitnessy clothing <laughs> you will ever wear in your yep. fitness journey. Um, the designs are great. doesn't look or feel like traditional athletic gear. Um, I, again, always talk about this. I like the muted colors, but if they were to go for a lime green, I would do my best to like it, but they don't. <laughs> um, what is Viore? Well, it's designed to work out in, but doesn't look or feel like it. You will want to wear it all of the time. It's an athletic clothing focused primarily for men. But as we always say, the women's stuff is banging. So if you guys want to try this new athletic gear for yourself, Viore is offering listeners a special offer Go to vioriclothing.com slash work for change. Again, that's vioriclothing, V U O R I, clothing.com slash work for change, where first time guests will get a 25% discount. 
It's a nice discount to try out the new clothing. Mm -hmm. Thank you again to Viore for partnering with us on this episode. It's like getting yourself to that mindset of like what's going to happen after you got you get done and, and starting with the end in mind. Having that vision there and understanding that like it's not going to it's it's arguably harder to go through that process of that gradual gaining phase. It's a weird psychological thing because you've created this reward system of when that scale goes down, I'm I happy. won, I won. Yep. Yeah, and so now it's flipping it on its head and understanding that like you're not gaining body fat. You're, you're, you're putting on muscle. You're actually setting yourself up for metabolic flexibility, a.k.a. like burning more calories at rest, and you're giving yourself the opportunity to create a lifestyle around this. And I think that's the, the hardest part is understanding that like this is that transition phase phase and it's going to take time it's going to take so much more time and that like that consistency thing it, it's it's a it's a weird thing nutrition is more psychological than it is anything else it's 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 what power do you give food why do you give some foods more power than others uh why why do you tell yourself a narrative around what foods you eat so like i hear a lot of people talk about like trigger foods and things like that it's like man it, it's when something's a trigger food, I completely understand it. But more times than not, it's when are you eating it and what story are you telling yourself around it? So, like, I'll see people. That's have, such a good point. When are you eating it? Yeah. It's huge. It's like, okay, did you did you have an Oreo after you had a big meal of protein, some vegetables that filled you up? And then the Oreo was for sustenance. Mm -hmm. It was for happiness. It wasn't – you should not – so, me and John talked about this earlier. It was around the idea of, like, what's healthy food or not. So – for me, obviously, it's whole, minimally processed, micronutrient-dense foods. I, I believe a food should be considered healthy when the goal behind the food is whether to eat more or to eat less. So we have a lot of these companies creating highly processed, highly palatable foods that are very calorically dense that make a lot of money by you eating a lot of them. And so that's where the whole argument of like Oreos and candy and ice cream and things like that, these companies succeed. They spend billions of dollars to make these products so damn tasty that nothing that comes out of the earth could replicate it. Oh, yeah. It can't even come close. Can't to even it. come yeah. close. And that's that's the beauty of it. I will never tell you not to eat it. I enjoy them on yeah. a daily basis. Uh, but I do not tell the narrative of this is bad. I tell the narrative of... It's the game I'm playing right now. If I eat this Oreo, understand that I'm going to want to eat more of them. It, it, it's just the name of the game. It's what – and have an Oreo, then try and taste a strawberry. Strawberry is going to taste like nothing. But, like, don't have an Oreo for a while or not have something sweet. Then you have a strawberry. Then it you just are messing with your taste buds. So, like, there's just so many ways you can go about it. It's resensitizing your, your taste buds. Like, maybe it's not having an Oreo for a while. So then those those strawberries and blueberries and raspberries taste sweet again. There's just many different things. But it's like, are you putting yourself in a position to succeed? That's it. If you don't have a good relationship with these foods yet, don't go trying to thrust them in and, and try and improve it just by putting it in there. It's not. You have to improve the narrative around the food first and foremost. Don't say, oh, if I have this, then this. It's like that's not, that, that's not true. You have a choice. And it's whenever you do give yourself that permission. And if you happen to eat a little bit more, it's okay. But that's the, the biggest thing is I just see so much narrative being created around various things like – and it's just, it's a facade. Mm -hmm. It's an excuse, and and, and it sucks. It, it's it sucks because all food is very awesome, and but some you can eat more, some you can eat less. That's that's it. And that reframe just it it helped me tremendously, and I've been sharing that a lot lately, and it's helped a lot of other people. So you um, <clears throat> have your training, mm -hmm. you decide to sell it, mm -hmm. but before it's not like you sold it and then started. Flexible dieting, right? Yeah. So when did that process, like you you said you were interning at a CrossFit gym, yep. but we never finished that of yeah. where you are now. So uh, that led me, so at that moment, whenever I was like, okay, there's got to be a better way. Uh, I got every nutrition textbook I could. Was uh, this after you were done doing the personal training? Oh, no, no, no. This was, this was when I was, man, this was when I was a senior in college. Okay. When I was a senior in college, I was in my free time reading every nutrition textbook, textbook I could find, mm -hmm. um, learning from uh, mentors and being able to, to expedite that process. That's where I found Lane, uh, Lane Norton, Alan Aragon, that whole crew. And I started diving into that and I was like, whoa, 
I was like, this is interesting. And so along that way, I went a bit extreme. It's when you when you tell me a different way to rule uh, the different rules of the game of nutrition. So I understood that macros were extremely important. Calories were extremely important. And those were the top of the totem pole. Okay, what am I going to do? Take all the foods that I quote unquote thought I couldn't have for the longest time like Pop-Tarts, cookies, cakes that were off limits and fit them into my macros. So can you explain uh, kind of like how you were eating before? Yep. Just for people that might not know, how Absolutely. you were eating before you found out about if it fits your macros yep. or flexible dieting. And I know you, th- there's like a difference in your yep. head with those. Um, and then once you found those types of diets, like how, what was your eating before and then after? So my eating before was just strict paleo. It was strict paleo. I was eating a ton of vegetables, a ton of salad, a lot of protein, um, a good amount of rice. Uh, it was typical sweet potatoes. Uh, I was under eating. I was very much so under eating. And so whenever I started doing macros, my calories were a little bit higher. My macros were a little bit higher. And I was fitting in as much as I possibly could. And I was rubbing it in. It was like a more of a social symbol. Yeah. It was like, hey, I can have this. I can have this. And my friends were like, what are you, like, what are you doing? And eventually it became a weird thing to where I would cheat on my macros. And so what's cheating on your macros? It's eating above them. Because I was uh, I was relying so much on foods that are not satiety based, they're sustenance, they're super calorically dense, not meant to be satiety type foods, and I wasn't eating as I was complete opposite. I wasn't eating as much vegetables or protein sources as I was before, and thus it led me to overeat on my macros all the time. Uh-huh. And it was the same process as what I was going through with paleo, and eventually over time, just I mean just like with anything, it's you find that medium ground. Mm-hmm. And then along the way, I'm known for a lot of uh, low, lower calorie, high protein recipes that are very innovative. I just started playing around with that. And because I wanted to have the best of both worlds, I wanted to hit my macros, not use a ton of my macros on um, certain foods and make more macro friendly options for the things that I was craving, like the pop tarts, the ice cream, etc. And so along the way, that's been something that's been really cool and, and being able to, to do that as well. So I hope that that and, and yeah. So, so how did specifically like FDL flexible dieting lifestyle, like that whole thing come into play? Yeah. So that happened in 2015. I started flexible dieting lifestyle.com and that became a hub. I, I remember I wrote 10 pretty five, 10, 5,000 word guides on how to get started with flexible dieting. Mm-hmm. And so like bang, those started ranking really high on SEO. Yep. And, uh, I was in a ton of Facebook groups, just like providing value. And so the brand was built through that. And then eventually early 2016, I started the Instagram account and I started sharing all everything, I, just documenting everything I was learning along the way. I started sharing recipes, started sharing just my journey and what I was going through. And then before I knew it by September of 2016, uh, cause I started it like February, January, February. And by September I had I think 37 or 40,000 followers on Instagram. And I went to my first ever fitness expo. That was the Olympia in Vegas. And I remember walking around there just as a spectator. And I, I kept on getting stopped. I'm like, like to take pictures. I'm like, what? I'm like, for real? I was like, this is cool. And I, I left there and I told myself, I remember going home and I told my mom, this is right after we had built the new gym and I was doing extremely well. Just to give perspective, I was training clients from uh, about seven to eight actual active hours with clients every single day, Monday through Saturday. Jeez. And we were doing yeah. extremely well. Yeah. And I get home and I tell my mom, I think I'm going to sell the gym. Six months. She's like, are you crazy? Like uh, the newspaper had just done a huge article on me. Like uh, I was seen as like my parents were so proud because they were like, yeah. we didn't know what you were doing, mm-hmm. but you figure this out and you're going to do this again. And I eventually, uh, yeah. So I told her six months and it ended up being eight months after, eight months after that, I ended up selling the gym. And I mean, along the way, FDL was growing in my free time. So it was from as if you're a personal trainer, you understand this from the, there's a low period around like 11 to four is usually where you're, you're not training a lot of people. And that's when I would go home. That's when I would uh, make a bunch of recipes. I would film them. And I remember I would film a savory and a sweet and I would literally be eating the food in the car on the way back to the gym and working out on a full stomach mm-hmm. because I mean, I, I got to find those clips like where I have a bunch of clips of me, like in the car actually eating on the way back to the <laughs> gym. And it was 
crazy. And I just did this for over a year, a year and a half. And I was just like every, it was consistent on my Sundays. I was just consistent. I was just working like crazy. And I remember October of 2016, I created my first recipe book. I didn't know how to do it. I went on Google, found a, a way to b- learn how to build my own recipe book, et cetera. And I remember just like putting it out to my audience and I think at the time it was like 12 bucks or something like that. And I remember in one day I sold like 250 and I was like, Ooh, wow. I was like, what? Yeah. I'm like, huh? And then by the end of 2016, I remember having to file the taxes for FDL. And I was like, oh my gosh, I made $123,000 in book sales between Damn. October and d- to December. Oh, wow. That's crazy. And I was like, and I was like, oh, now I know how to show my mom what I'm yeah. doing is okay. And yeah. so I made her a co-signer on that account so she uh. could see what was going <laughs> in there. And uh, I made her have the updates on her phone anytime I sold a book or anything. Uh. So she was just getting a ding, She's ding, like, okay, ding. okay, I get And I'd it. hear yeah. across the, hey, Zach, you sold it. I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and so she loved it. And that was just the way, because my parents always struggled with money my whole life. I mean, we weren't poor by any means, yeah. but money was always the conversation of why or why not we did, did something. Mm-hmm. And uh, I never wanted that to ever be, uh, I live way below my means. I save a lot of money to where money is never going to be the thing that determines whether I do anything. Mm-hmm. But that was uh, that was a huge moment. And so over time, I, I got to the point where I was able to sell the gym. And I moved to Austin, Texas, September 2017. I dr- sold the gym in May of 2017. And then I've been in Austin, Texas since. And that's when I started being full-time with FDL. And so your your love for for cooking did you have like a love for cooking before? So it was almost born out of like necessity for yourself. Absolutely, it was it was it was with paleo first because there was just a lot of the foods that were off limits. I was like, I'm gonna try some paleo recipes, and they were just terrible. <laughs> and, uh, and then eventually, I was like, I'm gonna start to try and make more macro friendly versions. And uh, I wasn't bad at all. Like I I've always saw a lot of things like. It's so funny. Like I listen to like John Bellion now mm-hmm. and I see how he creates music and it's, he pretty much creates it all himself. just m- manipulates his voice to make beats and various mm-hmm. things like that. And he'll have like various things he puts together, but he creates like an orchestra. And one thing I was like realizing is like, wow, like I've always been on every basketball team. I've always been like a facilitator. Like I understood this person's personality, this one, this one, this one, and how do we fit this together? And so I started to see that with nutrition and food. It's like, okay, we have this recipe. It's like it has the, all these different ingredients. Okay, this one's pretty calorically dense, this ingredient. how? What if I substitute it with something mm-hmm. like this? And then over time, I built this database on my head of common substitutions of that would make something more macro-friendly and how to bake with certain things and substitutions. And I was like, whoa, it's just over time, you just get better. And you start to see this little playbook that you have. It's like if this and this. If this and this, and then over time, that's just, it happened. Just, I just got a lot better. I would see a food that I was craving. It's like, let's just give it a try. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Let's just see what we can do. And then eventually. Okay. So I have a question. Yeah. Uh, this is going to be kind of weird, but for the people that are listening that might have any idea of what you do and how yeah. you're able to manipulate those macros on foods, if you could, exp- maybe, I'm not sure if you know this off the top of your head, but say a pizza, right? Yeah. So the pizza you're able to make, if you can like. I'm not sure if you know off the top of your head how many macros might be in a regular slice of pizza yeah. or like a regular whole pizza. Yeah. But if you can kind of show, you know, how many calories are in a regular pizza versus the version you're able to make yeah. and how that's helpful for people that might be. Well, ab- absolutely. It's it, Think of it this way. If I can give you a pizza that is half the calories of what you normally have, it's kind of like going to the store and getting something, buy one, get one free. Mm-hmm. You're like, man, like I get that same benefit with spending half amount. And that's what you want. I want you to see with your macros. It's like you're looking for the term macro friendly is foods that can fit into your macros with ease on a daily basis. That's how I see it. And that can be different for most people. John, the definition of John's macro friendly is a little bit different than most because he's training volumes very high. And so he needs more higher carb sources. Mm-hmm. And so with not as much fat and uh, some protein, not a ton, but he, his proportions are different. So that's going to vary from person to person. But so let's say if I can give you a pizza and make some substitutions in there and you can have the benefit of a pizza and not have the craving of wanting to have another pizza and I can flip the macronutrients on its head. If it can have higher protein, a little bit lower carb and lower fat, then a normal pizza doesn't have a lot of protein. It has a lot Pizza is a lot more of a fat source than a carb source. Uh, That's one thing that's a huge misnomer. It is a fat source 100%. And uh, you're going to have some carbs, but the fat is where the calories really add up. So 
that's where you're going to get a pizza that has more protein, lower fat, lower carb, and a better macronutrient profile that fits with ease into your diet. And that's mainly what I want to do is create foods that have more of a balanced macronutrient profile that normally wouldn't have a solid amount of protein, normally would have higher fat, higher carb, and thus it just fits with ease. It fits in so much better. And thus, if you have a balanced meal, you're not at the end of the day like, oh, I have to chug like three protein shakes or I have to eat just nothing but a bowl of egg whites. And it's like, that's just weird. Like, yeah. I, I don't I don't want people to have to do that. So then across the day, if you can sprinkle in various recipes, you're able to, to put yourself in a really good position to succeed. And so like if anybody ever buys my recipe book, they get an email right away that says, hey, my goal with this recipe book is you get 250 plus recipes in there. All I want you to do is pick five and eat those all the time. Mm -hmm. And whenever those get boring, pick some more. And that's yeah. it. Like you don't need to make something new every day. It's okay to eat similar stuff every single day. That's one of the most successful traits for most people that Absolutely. keep their weight off. 100%. Is they find recipes that fit seamlessly into their lifestyle, that fit into their goals. It's like go-to meals. That's yeah. what I like to call them. You yeah. know, like I have some of my go-to meals are like stir fry. Mm -hmm. You know, I show it all the time because it's like and the it's amount, delicious. Yeah, the amount of vegetables I can throw in there. And then I, I just – you know, I'll use six ounces of protein in there almost every time. And then, you know, there's a, usually maybe like 200 grams of carbs. Again, it's going to be different for everyone. But for me, that's what I do. Yeah. And it's like I know that, that after eating that meal, because of the volume, I'm going to feel full. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I won't need to eat anything afterwards. But yeah. if I want to, I can. Um, I think that go-to meals is one of the most important things for people that are, one, trying to lose weight. But even more, that are trying to keep weight off. Mm -hmm. Because having those go-to meals, one of the biggest things with – Weight loss and, and dealing with keeping weight off is stress and stress around food. Because if you're sh constantly stressed about food and constantly stressed about what you're going to eat next, it makes making the right decision a lot harder. Well, I, I mean, it's so funny. When I went to go visit my meme, that's grandmother in French. She <laughs> loves watching My 600-Pound Life. <laughs> yeah, that, shows, that show is addicting. It's intense. and It's, I, it's, it's scary. It made me really want to watch it now because of the aspect. I, I mean, I, I, I love hanging out with John because – I share a love for the ver the obese community, the very overweight community, because I know exactly the the storyline and the narrative that's going on in, in in most of their heads. I've just talked to so many people, yeah. and we've had so many conversations. And it's it's giving yourself permission, but it's it's the idea of that that reward system of food. It's like, man, when I see a lot of these people that are extremely overweight, it's it's constantly like, man, what does my life look like until my next meal? It's like, man, like I'm just killing time till my next meal. Yeah, that's wh that's what it becomes. Uh, it's and it's sad, and that's where like it really comes into play. It's like, man, it's a, if you can put yourself in a better position to succeed. First and foremost, like find some stuff that you're passionate about. Like, wow, like whenever I'm working on something that I'm extremely passionate about, I don't eat the food. Like, at a physiological level, if you're in flow, flow is like in the zone. Like you're in something, immersed in it. Time is irrelevant. Your hunger signals go down. That's pure survival. It's like if you're just in the zone of anything, hunger signals aren't going to be there. So you can crush whatever you need to do. And then whenever you get done, you're like, oh, I'm hungry. And you're like, oh, I got it. So like that's the number one thing is like finding things that you're like you're super passionate about that you can just dive into and you you don't think about food and, and that's the number one thing. It's like, it doesn't have to happen overnight, but you have to understand, think about your day. How much am I thinking about food? And when you find those meals that are kind of like click were like, you're just like a habit, you understand that like I normally eat at this time. I like this meal. I like how it's going to make me feel. It's probably going to keep me full till this time. Then you don't have to worry about it anymore. And it's just, and you enjoy it and it makes you happy. And then you're like, man, this is great. I found something that works. And then you just repeat that process and you just plug and play, plug and play. And then before you know it, you have this really cool system that's kind of intuitive. Like, for example, I'm in week 13 of my cut and I haven't really tracked macros this whole time. And uh, I'm down 15 pounds in 13 weeks. It's been very sustainable. And that's a huge thing for me. Ma tracking macros for the longest time was a stress reliever for me, understanding that I was hitting these macros and I was I was good. Then it got to the point where I was like, man, I'm just going to give this a try. And now tracking macros feels stressful to me. Mm. And I'm like, for most people, that's very common. 
And so I'm trying to put myself in a position of what are the checks and balances that I can put in my life that rely on me not tracking my macros and I can still reach my goals. And that puts me in the shoes of most people that are busy, that have, they're traveling a lot, which I'm doing a lot more of, and they have a lot of unknowns. How can you create a lot of knowns in your life when there's a lot of variables moving around? It's just controlling what you can control. And not, maybe, maybe not even for someone who's like traveling all the time, but like someone who's eight to five, nine to five, yep. you know, and they've got responsibilities before work, responsibilities after work. They can't be spending every second thinking about who was this new mm-hmm. recipe? What's this new, you know, it's like, that's where go to, that's where mindless meals, like, you know, not mindless eating, but like a meal that doesn't cause you to like spend so much extra time cooking, preparing, yep. prepping. Um, that's where that's super important. And when you have that kind of job or we have that busy lifestyle, having those like go to meals are what's going to allow you to still have that physique you want to have mm-hmm. or perform the way you want to. And you don't need to be a full time athlete to have the, the body and the physique that you want. Yeah. It- and like the, uh, the go-to meals too. Another big part is that the more you make it, the more efficient you get at making it. Yeah. So you're not like, I'm really hungry, but I have to cook this thing. It's probably going to take me 30 minutes to cook. Yeah. Once you, when you do the go-to meal long enough, like for me, the stir fry, it takes me no time at mm-hmm. all to make that. It's I know that I'll be hungry. I'll make the stir fry. Take me five minutes. Bam. Done. Yep. It's like, uh, my brother and I both spent a little stint working at Starbucks. And when you're first learning how to make a latte or a frappuccino, First of all, frappuccinos are the worst thing in the world to make. Yeah. I oh, can't stand yeah, them. Yeah, they take forever. They took forever. Yeah. When you're learning, it's like, do this. You need to do the base. You need to do the milk. You need to do the sauce. You need to do this. You need to blend it. You need whipped cream. Like, mm-hmm. it's like so annoying. But you do get to a point where it's like, okay, frappuccino. Yep. And then you start making something else yeah, you while get, you're waiting for the frappuccino Yeah, because you have to wait for it. You put it in the blender. Like, it's something they teach you at Starbucks. You start with the frappuccino. You put it in the blender. While it's blending, you, you should be making another drink. Like, when it's busy, it gets pretty crazy. It's oh. actually. Yeah, yeah, but when you're learning how to make it, that's yeah, that all happen. you're thinking about mm-hmm. yeah. is the steps that's required to make that frappuccino. And then you, you get efficient over time. So, like, that's one thing. It's like never, ever, ever try something new when you're hungry. No. Yeah. yeah. Don't, <laughs> oh, my gosh. So, like, you're, 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 you're just not. Well, because you'll end up like me and snacking while you're. Absolutely. Like, that's what I do. I'm like yeah. making food. And I'm like, why am I eating pretzels? What happened? And God, <laughs> God, and God forbid if you mess up, like you're going to be pissed. Yep. Yeah. And then pissed. you're going to eat the Oreos yeah. and cookies that you shouldn't, probably shouldn't be yep. eating, you know, yep. that aren't fitting into your macros. Yeah. It's just putting yourself in a, the best position to succeed. It's asking yourself the right questions. Am I in a position right now to eat like. Obviously, am I in a position right now? Am I famished? I'm not touching those damn Oreos. Mm-hmm. No, 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 yeah. no way. Zero, zero. Or yeah. eating Oreos should not be, I'm hungry. Yeah. I'm going to eat Oreos. No. That's not how Oreos should be like, no. Nope. well, I would like something sweet. Yep. I'll have a couple Oreos. I agree. Uh, okay, so I wanted to ask you, we kind of talked about it a little bit, like not on the, on the podcast, but you were talking about, in your mind, the difference between if it fits your macros and flexible dieting. Yeah. Because a lot of people will say that's the same thing. Yep. And if you... It kind of is. It is, yeah. But you, you you like to kind of separate them, and I like the way that you explain it. It, it, it is the same if you have the right perspective. And with flexible dieting, I understand that I, I believe flexible dieting is more of a mindset rather than like a rule system. It's a Flexible dieting is the more n- nutritional knowledge you have, the more flexible you can be with your diet. It is an X, Y axis, and that line is going straight. As one increases, the other increases. You have the choice to be more flexible. You don't have to. And that's the biggest difference for me is like with it, if it fits your macros, I can be flexible dieting and not tracking macros. It's more of a mindset of understanding the hierarchy of importance. I understand calories and macros are extremely important, and a lot of the other things are secondary. Mm. And if it fits your macros, makes macros the the number one thing if you're hitting your macros nothing else necessarily matters obviously those other things matter but it's in the name it's in the name if it fits your macros and it's like i don't don't like that i like the idea of flexible flexible dieting i want it to be like more flexible nutrition etc it's like you're just looking at your life and what is the definition of like nutritional freedom for you what would it feel like to be nutritionally free and maybe that is not tracking macros. Maybe it is at times. I just believe flexible dieting just gives you a choice to be in the best position to succeed no matter what your life looks like. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't entail uh, 
you don't have to be flexible. You can be a clean eater and have a flexible diet. Mm-hmm. You can you can track macros all the time and have a flexible diet. You can intermittent fast and have a flexible diet. You can do all these different things with just understanding the hierarchy of importance. What really matters and then building something perfect around you. So for somebody that understands like at the nutritional hierarchy of importance, at the base we have our calories and our macros, the two most important things that, that really equate for a lot of the benefits, it's after that in the application process that it can kind of shift to more of a flexible dieting approach. It's not the the score is did I hit my macros or not. So in reality, I know that they're the same. And if you've been in the game for five plus years, you know it. But for most people starting out, it's it's hard because I saw myself glorify macros over everything else. Mm-hmm. And now I, I truly understand that it's so much more than macros. And like what you were talking about, the the hierarchy of importance, you know, with like if you're looking at a pyramid, the base of it is calories and then maybe a little bit above that is macros. macros yep. What I've noticed with diets that, you know, people become very religious about, you know, um, keto, whatever yep. it is that you want to say, I'm, you know, keto is fine. I'm not, this isn't me talking bad about keto, but you know, those types of diets. Um, a lot of times what ends up, what I've noticed is what ends up happening is the hierarchy of por- importance things end up getting pulled down to the base that maybe shouldn't be there. Mm-hmm. Um, so like on a lot of diets, it's a uh, meal, like choice, choice of what you're putting in your meals. You know what I mean? Like turning things that are healthy and things that are unhealthy, you know? Mm-hmm. So then those things get pulled down or it might be meal timing, right? A lot of people that um, are very into fasting, meal timing is like the most important thing. Yep. Um, when in reality, I've always felt calories are king. Most important, that is all, should always be the base of whatever diet it's is. It's not even a doing. feeling. It's fact. Yeah. It's yeah. fact. Ex- science, yeah. yeah. Science backed, you know, uh, I'm the worst at like stating facts. No. I'm always like, I don't want to upset <laughs> no, anybody. Absolutely. But, and then, but, so what I've noted, the, the point I was trying to make is normally when a diet is, you know, either a fad diet or, you know, just a diet that I don't feel is sustainable, the hierarchy of importance is a little jacked up. Uh, absolutely well i mean this is the biggest thing is like you got to contort the data you got to contort the period the pyramid in order to make your diet seem you're hammering on something that is a one to two percent benefit to make it seem like it's the 95 to 97 and i feel the same way about like supplements Mm -hmm. people that are very into supplements it's like they're that i mean the supplements are the very tip of the pyramid in my in my eyes i think they are the they, they are the least important. If you never take a supplement, you can absolutely hit your goals without a doubt. Mm-hmm. I believe that 100%. But think about it. If your calories are jacked up, you're never going to hit your goals. So that's why calories are at the bottom. But supplements, people try and, you know, supplement companies or whatever, they try and bring that, that, that tip of the pyramid. They're trying to bring it down to the base. Like, no, no, no. You need this supplement to yeah, hit your Yeah, well, goals. I mean, when you think about it, like, the people who have the le- least amount of ground to stand on are typically the loudest, right? Because they need to, like show everyone that what they're doing or what they sell or what whatever is important. Whereas, you know, the stuff that's actually important doesn't need to be that loud because yep. it, like, it'll, it will stand. It will, it'll stand the test of time. It will remain. And so typically there's a, there's like a quiet confidence with like, no, I know this works. Do you like, don't be ridiculous. Don't be crazy. But then it's like those. Fads. It's not. It's not as sexy. Yeah, exactly. It's but not it's, as sexy. but it's, but those like fads or those little tiny top of the pyramid things. They need to make their opinion heard so that everyone knows they're there. Mm-hmm. And then it's really loud for a second, and then it kind of goes away. And then there's another one that's really loud for a second. Whereas, calorie macro, like that's just a, it's a slow, steady, quiet, it's not confidence. sexy whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's methodical. It's not a shortcut. It's zero. It and placebo doesn't become a part of it. So for example, yeah, a lot yeah. of the supplements that people take, oh my gosh, the ben- so there's uh, some pretty crazy studies that just came out that were just published about CBD and <laughs> they're showing the benefits of CBD are placebo and not from the actual CBD, mm-hmm. which is super fascinating because it makes sense. You'd have to in order to force a physiological response, you'd have to take your whole bottle to get the dose that you'd actually need, not yeah, your 60 to 90 servings. <laughs> I've and said this about CBD. <laughs> like, I've never seen someone post about it that is not sponsored yeah. by a company that yeah. sells CBD. Like, I've never seen like, oh, I just like it. It's like, no, almost all, all the time. I'm sure there's people that post about it that isn't, but yeah. I, For the I, most part, yeah. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. Uh, yeah, the placebo with CBD, well, the, it almost, it's it blows my mind with CBD, the amount 
it's just the the sheer amount of benefits that CBD can give you. I'm like, how can one thing benefits bene- in quote benefits in quotes? Yeah, how can one thing get benefit your sleep, your um, you know, your inflammation, your uh, depression, anxiety, all like literally, it's like everything. There's even rubs where it's like, oh, if you you feel some pain in your knee, rub the CBD. Yeah. Like for me, I've I've always been weary. The more like John was saying, the more someone shouting about something, the less I'm like, eh. I just like I just don't believe it. Yeah. Well, the the more shouting is necessary for the placebo to be there. Yeah. That's it. If you're over promising, what can make that over over promising actually happen? It's making somebody actually believe it. It's changing the narrative. If somebody spends, so for example, this is a big thing. If somebody spends fifty dollars on a CBD supplement mm-hmm. and they take that CBD supplement, they want that to the, work. They want they it want to, it work. to work. And so they're buying it. If they can't sleep, they have anxiety, everything's, and they, and they see other people doing it. This is the one thing that might help. They're changing the narrative of what's happening with them. When they take that CBD, they're in, in their head, they're like, I should feel something. And what happens? They feel it because they force themselves to feel it. Which Not only because they spent the money associated thing, with guess. it. Oh, it's absolutely. Yeah. Placebo is amazing. Yeah, yeah, 100%. It's amazing. I love it so much. Like, Man, I want somebody to feed me decaf coffee, and yeah. I want to see if I actually, yeah, right, actually, it, yeah. like how much caffeine is actually really benefiting me, or is it the fact of just the habit knowing the, I drank, knowing caffeine. that I drank caffeine? Mm-hmm. It's like there's so many different things, and it's so hard to run studies like that because it's expensive. Like running a study where y- you control all the variables like that, and you have a human being, not a, some not some animal or a rat or a mouse. Yeah. It's like you actually have a human being. You have to pay that human being to be there yeah. unless you're doing that in prison. And, mm-hmm. with the, with and then there's – Yeah, it's just – Yeah. It's an interesting thing. It's like, man, when, when, I, when I look at nutrition as a whole, it's like, man, what power are you giving food? What is your nutritional hierarchy of importance? And are you giving yourself per- permission to succeed? And it's that it's really that simple. The one of the biggest things with nutrition is pulling the veil back. Because so many people, myself included, is I, I've kind of used this analogy before, is you think of it as this huge dragon that you need to slay. Mm-hmm. And you think of it as like, you know, if you're not focused on if you don't really know much about flexible dieting, you're not fo- you don't know about your TDE, which is total daily energy expenditure, like how many calories do you need to eat? You've seen so many different weight loss ways. There's so many different diets. It it can be overwhelming without a doubt. Yeah. So that's why I am so and I mean I feel like you're exactly the same way. I'm so passionate about giving people the knowledge they need to succeed. And it really really is not that much. There is n- it's not that hard to find out how many calories you should be eating and to eat under that. It's not that hard to find out the information. It's very simple. And I've yeah. always said simple doesn't mean easy. Mm-mm. It is very difficult, especially if you're super obese. Because you, you 100%, if you're 200 pounds overweight, you have an issue with food. There is some sort of addiction there for most people. I can't say everybody. But there's there's an issue there. There's a narrative around there's, the food. Yeah, they're 100%. Yeah. So the hardest part usually isn't actually finding out the information it's obviously putting the information to use but the issue is is that a lot of people still aren't getting the information because it is not sexy to hear it's going to take a few years to lose the weight slowly it's like no i want to lose 15 pounds in the first week i want to lose 20 pounds in the first week nutrisystem is the way for me it's just that's the that i get so frustrated about well, it i it, get so it, it's hard there's just an, it's just like starting a new recipe and you've never done it before there's an upfront learning curve yeah 100 percent. it's just helping somebody like that see the vision like where are we going what are we doing and how is this going to help you and so like i don't, I, I don't think there's enough great empathy towards somebody who's overweight and and recognizing it. like when i'm watching my 600 pound life it's just oh you're eating too much oh you suck or all these different things i'm like have the conversation like i understand where you're coming from i i know your narrative around food is this i know food is amazing we don't have to change that much let's look at your day what are you doing right now let's make one or two changes and you're gonna when you're that big you're doing a lot wrong like mm-hmm. you're doing yeah. so much wrong and you can make one or you just look at it as a whole. What are the one to two changes that we can make that will get that domino flowing that you won't even notice? Usually my biggest thing, usually when someone's super obese, it's just stop drinking calories. Mm-hmm. And if that means you're drinking soda and you know, this might be controversial, but if that means, okay, I'm just going to drink diet soda. 
that is better than drinking a thousand calories just in soda a yep. day. That's my opinion. Yeah. You know, and so that that is one of the biggest tools. Like I've always said, the bigger you are, the easier it is to lose weight at the start because you can make a small change, which is drinking calories. Because if you are six hundred pounds, you are drinking a lot of calories to Amen. make that happen, yeah. almost yeah. always. Yeah. So if you just take out liquid calories and still, even if you still want to drink diet soda, whatever, it's still better than drinking, you know, a thousand calories and gaining pounds and pounds a week or a month just from that soda yep. yeah it's, it's easy to make those changes absolutely and, and it's also being like man like let's have some bouts where you're kind of hungry like mm -hmm. get it's, comfortable yeah. with being hungry it's okay like, yeah. it's, a, it's 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 okay you're gonna be fine and uh it's funny like we me and john were talking about this uh, yesterday too it's like the uh, the research on they followed this guy fasted for 379 days he lost over 200 and something pounds uh, he was close to 500 pounds and now we have a lot of people that are in the uh, that are obese that are doing these prolonged fast and obviously replacing minerals with uh, their uh, their electrolytes and making sure that's in check but it's mostly it's just a water fast and that's okay if you're extremely big you have reserves of energy mm -hmm. but it's not for like the average human being that should that's at a healthy body weight yeah. and that needs to be doing these prolonged fasts it's like that's absolutely absurd that's putting a band aid on top of something that needs to be taken care of yeah and it's not like not not know going to the source it's just, it's literally a band-aid it's that all or nothing mentality and so like for somebody who's wanting to lose a lot of weight i think it's okay like for example like be try skipping breakfast try skipping breakfast and getting uh, and replacing that m time when you would eat in the morning with like maybe a little bit of a walk or some type of self-development listening to podcasts in the morning or something that you're working on that you're passionate about get in that mindset of like man i can do, do work, I can get into flow and I don't have to necessarily think about food and it's okay to be hungry. And then you truly realize like, man, being hungry is not scary. It's mm -hmm. human. Yeah. When your hunger disappears, something's wrong. When you're not getting those hunger cues, something's wrong. You're, you're, I mean, obviously it's, it's relative, but being hungry is actually a cool thing. Mm -hmm. It's a cool thing. It lets you know you're alive, your body's there. So, so you're someone who's definitely, um, you're very passionate and mm -hmm. you do what you're passionate about. Absolutely. Um, what are you passionate about right now? And what do you see? What's like, maybe not what's next, but how is FDL? How are you like, what's shaping what's happening? What's, yeah. what's so, the, you know what I mean? Yeah. FDL is transitioning from a flexible dieting company, I would say into a flexible dieting media company. So we're transitioning into the, the spot where you come for nutritional freedom and creating and highlighting people around the industry that are, are in support of that, that we believe in. So in 2020, we're going to be hosting in Austin, uh, and I'd love for you guys to be there, uh, the Flexible Dieting Summit. And that's going to be in Austin, Texas. And we're Sweet, bringing, yeah. yeah, we're bringing any all excuse to go to Texas. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it'll be, it'll be cool. I'm from Texas. <laughs> <laughs> the, the cool part about Austin, it's, it's not that it's, kind of Texas. It's so yeah. different. Yeah. It's so different. It's very si similar to San Diego. So we're working on that. Uh, podcast has I think, been an extension of that. It's been absolutely amazing. And yeah, talk about your podcast. Yeah. You have a podcast and yeah. you, you do a lot of talks that kind of similar to what we've been talking about. Absolutely. Today, right? So if you guys want, it's, sim it's set up similar to a Netflix show. And so we set it up season one, season two, uh, season one was set up with how to get started with flexible dieting and, and everything literally you need to know in order to, to get started with everything that I'm talking about here. And each episode builds onto the next They're about 25 to 30 minutes. They're very to the point, take home type stuff. We have tons of show notes that you can download with all kinds of cheat sheets. We've really... Uh, gone above and beyond uh, with it and just want to put people in a better position to succeed. That's really what it's all about. So for that, that's been amazing. And then also... Uh, how, do you, how do people find that? What is uh, it? Uh, on iTunes. It's the Flexible Dieting Lifestyle Podcast. Uh, so yeah, it'll pop right up on we'll iTunes. We'll put that in the show notes yeah. and in the, uh, the link if you're watching on YouTube. So Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, we... And then so recently, uh, John kind of saw this happening uh, a little over a year ago we created a separate company uh, called Flex. And so Flex, is the premises is creating new and innovative products that uh, are low-calorie, high-protein, but help you 
put you in a better position to succeed with your nutrition. And so they're innovative. They've never been created before. So we created the first ever powdered protein cookie butter. So it's an add water product that can be turned right into a cookie butter that you can put on anything or you can add it to your Greek yogurt to make it thick, oatmeal to make it thick. It's just a very versatile product. And so I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but we're coming out with uh, more savory add water type products. Um, one of them is probably going to be something that John mentioned earlier that starts <laughs> with a P and ends with a Z. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, is he going to say it? <laughs> so, we got the hot scoop here yeah, on the, uh, so the podcast. I don't know what Piazza is, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to try it. <laughs> he was a baseball player back then. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the Mets, the Mets. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's uh, that's been really, really fun. Food science is always something I'm so fascinated about. And so now I'm just reverse engineering a lot of products and making them just add water to where that's a convenience. There's not that friction of, I don't know how to do this. I don't have time to do this. And mm-hmm. people, people love convenience and anything I can do to help them be in a better spot. That's going to be something I'm doing. So that's something I'm extremely passionate about. And so it's those two things and we're con- continuing to create more products with that company. And we're, we have some huge meetings later on this summer to be in a lot of big box stores. So that's going to be unreal. So uh, yeah, I'm just exciting, extremely, man. extremely grateful. Those are the two things that I'm really, and obviously furthering relationships, like traveling a ton, like yeah. hanging out with you guys and just, and just, yeah, I, I've realized in life, man, life is all about who you surround yourself with, the relationships you have. Do you have people around you that are, are, are nothing about abundance, uh, are all about abundance. They're asking you, how can I help you? Oh, wow, that's a great idea. What's the first step to, that we need to do to make it happen? Instead of those people that always give, they always say the negative thing first. Mm-hmm. They're like, oh, well, what that about that? That won't work because of this. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, no, 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 no. I'm fascinated by the compliment sandwich. Wow, that's, that's, a, that's a great idea. I think it's probably going to work. Ah, did you think about like this one hurdle that might happen? And then we have a conversation that are like, whoa, like, wow. Like if you handle these two, like few things here, this is going to be a home run. Yeah. Let me know if I can help. It's yeah. like, those are the type of people that you want in your life. And For that's, sure. That's, that's all you want. And so if you don't have those people right now, listening to podcasts like this, find, reading books, I'm telling you, reading books will change your perspective. You can walk out of wherever you are and see the world completely different from reading just one book. Mm-hmm. And if you expedite that process over time, it cements in your brain and you see the world completely differently life is happening for me not to me so anything that happens it's either it went well or you learned and it's that simple so you just can't be so hard on yourself if you ate a whole pack of oreos damn it you learned why did you eat that whole pack when did you have it and it's just a reframe it's like well then you won't let it happen again because you're you're learning or next time you might learn another thing when you ate a whole pack and then eventually you're gonna the goal is to not yeah and but that's just the whole process it's like man i learned that it's fun to eat a whole pack (laughs) (laughs) and if that's what if that's what you learn man good dope i'm happy for you but yeah cool man well Thank you so much for uh, coming out and yeah. talking with us. Yeah, yeah this is cool. This, this was, was cool. fun. This was a fun podcast to film. Yeah. yeah. I had a good time. Yeah.